So to push out that that Fed posting uh, metaphor, do you think then that the, any sort of antagonism towards the current system isn't actually an antagonism, but that the system's just subsuming it back into it, and that's actually bolstering the system that we have? That's correct. Okay, so basically, we yes. we, we you're you're asking us to we really do need to stop shit posting. That's what you're saying. <laughs> well, the thing is, the thing is, your 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 objective in sh- you know, um, I I would never uh, shit posting is an art form, and there's a difference between shit posting and fed posting, and um um, you know, the art of of um, the art of of the properly done shit post uh, is 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 a great one, but it's a high art. It demands skill. You know, those who have no skill should not attempt to do art. That's just a basic, unfortunate, undemocratic reality of the world. Um, you know, if you want to get into, do you want to? Uh, are any of your readers on 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 uh, Twitter by any chance? Um, do you want to get into some some Twitter deep like Twitter politics? Because I'm not on Twitter, but. I'm not on Twitter, but I do uh, observe uh, Twitter occasionally. Uh, so can I can I answer that question by describing something on Twitter? Uh, so 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 um, there's this this wonderful concept, which is the concept of a groiper, uh, and the groiper was uh, invented by some artist on 4chan and um, as a variant on Pepe. And um, the sad thing about groipers is that. At first, the groiper was a toad of peace, and um, the values of the deep groiper community, the real groipers, um, um, you know, they had this wonderful word that they used. I think that um, since their shit has been stolen, this has disappeared. Uh, I could be wrong, but they had this wonderful word that they used, which was cozy. Um, You know, the essential property of the true groiper is that the groiper is cozy. Uh, And so the thing is, if your shit post is cozy, that's great. Now, then uh, it was uh, Groypers were stolen by this kid, Nick Fuentes, uh, who's uh, very talented uh, and, and very young. Uh, and, you know, hey, he saw a good thing and he stole it. But, um, you know, uh, he, of course, is very antagonistic. And um, that, uh, you know, I just don't find that to be objectively effective. I'm sure he disagrees. Um, in fact, I think it's objective. In general, antagonizing power is... Uh, is beneficial to power mm-hmm. because they're able to define what it is you're actually saying because they've got the power. Yes, and 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 moreover, one of the things that happens very very frequently um, is that you actually inhabit their frame, and so what they say to you is basically these are who our opponents are, and because they're the authority, you listen to them. Okay, this is how you oppose us. This is what the people who oppose us are like. And so, you know, let's say you're a kid in high school and, you know, you've been just been sent. You, you shit, you shit posted in class, maybe even fed posted in class. And um, you got sent to the guidance counselor and your guidance counselor, you know, sits you down and gives you, um, you know, half an hour of pure Marxist jargon. Right. And um, um, pure Marxist jargon. And then she says, OK, you know, this is what you need to believe as a good person. And if you don't believe this, you're a Nazi. And, you know, the kid, imagine the kid is like, you know, you know, James Dean. And no, it's not it's Re- Marlon Brando and Rebel Without a Cause. Right. He's like, you know, OK, guess I'm a Nazi. Right. You know, it's like the most natural psychological thing to do. And so when they present to you this proposition that the only thing that your only real choices are to be uh, progressive or to just go straight straight out hail victory um you know once you accept that dichotomy you're already fucked when you antagonize them from a position of being the heel within their kayfabe if you know their the wrestling terms um you're basically you're reinforcing their narrative you're reinforcing their story you're doing actually much more useful than any supporter of power could be um and is it possible to sort of break free of the pattern and, and you know break the pattern and basically not be a sucker in this sense sure it's theoretically possible but it's very very hard and if you're basically looking for an obvious way to antagonize the regime you're almost certainly going to wind up being a tool even with of course the best intentions possible and so you know what's funny about this is that basically what it means and this is kind of the you know the topic i i I explored in my first chapter and i'm exploring a little more in my second um is that if you oppose the regime if you sort of hope to act against power 
um, <clears throat> and you're a dissident, you're a tool, unfortunately. But if you're acting basically for the regime, what's going on in your mind? You're, what's going on in your mind is basically, I want to help black people. So I want to help black people, and my means of helping black people is to knock over statues. Okay, so basically, um, to an objective observer, this is deranged. But basically, the reason that this derangement persists is what they're saying is, I want to help black people. What they're doing is knocking over statues. And what they're actually doing is supporting the regime by flexing on its enemies. And so they're tools too, right? And so it's basically like everyone who involves themselves with this whole system by default is acting as a tool. And so essentially, you know, the sort of the initial ask, you know, to use a Silicon Valley term, the initial ask is basically just like, if nothing else, just please don't be a fucking tool. The thing is, what's telling you to be a tool is essentially a political instinct. And it's this instinct to matter. It's this, the, you know, what, what Plato called themos, the Greeks called themos. It's very analogous to eros. It's the desire to matter, the desire to be important. You know, every high school senior in America wants to change the world, right? At least on their college applications. Um, and pretty sure most of them are not going to change it at all. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure it's not even going to change. Um, and um, so you have this... Um, um, this sort of all of this kind of fake pornographic importance that's basically going around. And so you, you acquire this, what the way the system commands your attention is that it gives you importance in exchange for being a tool. So basically, and that importance is almost always fake importance. So you're essentially, um, you know, detachment for me, uh, which is is this basically it's it's political no fap it's just you know essentially like whatever you're doing like you know like the art of shit posting is great like definitely um the art of having a clear perception of what's going on today as clear as 2020 will be to the year 2520 um you know is absolutely essential you know there's more than enough work there um, and you just shouldn't, you just, you don't even need to antagonize this thing. Um, to a considerable extent, it's dependent on your antagonism. Um, you know, there's a bas yeah, I don't know if you, well, you don't play basketball over there, but there's this basketball move called uh, pulling the chair where you basically, um, someone's pushing up against you and then you step away from him and he falls down. Um, and, um, so, you know, you know, pull the chair. Um, and that's not a sort of complete plan for solving the problems that we have. But the thing is, once you, in a way, there's another analogy that, you know, maybe most of your listeners will um, understand because I'll, I'll bet, you know, most of them know what a PUA is. The, um, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm a happily married man, obviously, but I'm, I'm familiar with this dialogue, uh, which has its flaws and its virtues. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that PUAs will tell you there's definitely some effective advice, uh, you know, out there. Uh, there's also some very bad advice out there. But one of the things that they will tell you that's basic is that if you want anything, specifically um, if you're a guy and you want women to like you, um, you need to be able to control your desire. You need to basically stop thirsting. You need to basically say, here's this instinct that I have, Eros. And, um, you know, my control over my Eros is so complete that this amazingly beautiful woman, this perfect 10, can be standing next to me at a party and I can, like, look right past her like she didn't exist. And then, you know, when she looks at me, she'll be like, who is this guy who looked pa right past me like, like I didn't exist? Nobody ever does that. And then, you know, he's this, like, five foot three, 200-pound nerd, right? You know, but he looks past me like I didn't exist. There's something here, right? You know, and that's, that's, that's what you're trying to trigger by basically consciously mastering that instinct and turning it off. And in the case of people's political instinct, it's especially important to turn it off because you're basically just being a tool. You're not getting anywhere. There's no prospect of creating a political baby here. Um, you know, and um, this is a completely infertile exercise, and it's actually causing the problem that it claims, or it's helping to cause the problem that it claims to, you know, be purporting to solve. Um, and moreover, if you turn off this kind of instinctive thrashing of desire, you can basically start actually thinking strategically. 
because, um, you know, controlling this instinct allows you to think, you know, it allows you to kind of pass the marshmallow test a little bit. You know, the marshmallow test. Um, it's this test for it's a it's a test for um, kind of a executive function that's given to small children where you basically tell them they can have one marshmallow now or two in five minutes. <laughs> Um, um, and so the thing is basically what you see in the history of dissidents is this kind of constant craving for impact and meaning and success. And, you know, then, you know, it turns into, um, in sort of 2015, 2016, when the mainstream discovers that there's a sort of weird fermentation going on out there, it sort of turns into just straight out toxic media whoring um and um um just becomes really like just fails spectacularly and of course you know what is donald trump but straight out toxic media whoring um and so um you know you're seeing a lot of those illusions a lot of those kind of mainstream maga illusions i think are are collapsing right now uh which is great mainstream conservative illusions are collapsing uh because the strategy of putting judges on the supreme court doesn't seem to actually work um and um so you're basically seeing like I think a lot of people being who are um, opposed to the powers that be uh, sort of being forced to realize that their strategy for opposing these powers simply does not work. Um, and uh, the more obvious that gets, I think, I think the better. It seems what you're talking about there is um, I think it might've come up in unqualified reservations is um, Hirschman's book, um, uh, exit voice and loyalty. So you have sure. this, you have this power, um, and if you're loyal to it, you're a collaborator. In the words of Grey Mirror, uh, if you're um, if you have a voice, you're a dissident and a tool. But of course, there's this problem yeah. of exit. So is is exit the same as detachment, or and and how do we exit? And I think a big question well, would be, in what way, you know, when you have people who ha already have a lot of power but are dissidents in their mind, so like elite. Yeah, elite exiters. What should they be doing, and, and what should exiters be doing? Like, in what way can we kind of start this detachment? Uh, what they should be doing is 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 what they're doing right now, which is um, another term for this that was frequently used in the 19th century was internal exile. You know, they essentially they behave like an expat. You know, even though they're still still living there, and of course they they basically um, live in the closet. And I would certainly advise anyone who's in the closet to uh, to stay there and uh, you know delete your tweets while you still can. There's 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 much to be said, um, you, you know, for the closet. When you come back to exit voice and loyalty, um, the essential problem is that there's there's really no exit from a global empire, not in the literal sense of the word. Uh, I have friends who are like, oh, I want to move to Hungary. I'm like, you know, Hungary uh, is maybe where Franco Spain was in 1975, 1970, something like that. Maybe even 1960, maybe even 1960. You know, the idea that uh, that Hungary will um, will stay this national populist, you know, kleptocracy that it is, uh, you know, for another 20 years, uh, I would say is preposterous. Um, and then you'll see a complete cultural revolution there and everything associated with the old regime will be very aggressively and rapidly destroyed. Um, and um, the, um, uh, I mean, look at what's left of Franco Spain, right? You know, some, some, you know, architecture. So, so in a way there's no, there's no real exit from, from a global state. The answer is actually pretty simple in my opinion, which is, that you have to stop thinking of political change as an incremental process. Your model of, you know, let's do some little thing and then we'll do some bigger thing and so on, you know, um, is a model that derives from many, many centuries of leftist revolutionary experience. Um, during all of these centuries, the same formulas have been tried in reverse and they have never worked because there's, there's a fundamental asymmetry there. There's, um, you're, I assume, familiar with the concept of, of entropy and extropy. And so, you know, if I, if I throw a glass up in the air uh, and it falls on the floor, it'll smash. But if I sweep the pieces up and throw them up in the air, they will not come together and land on the counter as a glass. And, you know, essentially when people try to reverse 
the processes of leftism or apply those lessons which they see working to the right. And this affects everything from like passive resistance to terrorism to everything in between. None of it ever works. Your demonstrations, good luck with that. So when you look at um, entropy in the real world, you see that there are two broad forms of entropy. There's a fast form and a slow form. Fast entropy is like a fire. Slow entropy is like rust. What's interesting is that you see both of these phenomena in a political context as well. So fire is like revolution. Rust is like basically decadence. America is pretty rusted out as a vehicle in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, and, you know, but it, it still could catch fire a little bit. It doesn't seem it's very what you see is generally the rust is in. Um, it's a little like Dutch elm disease where the Chinese elms are adapted to it, but the Western elms are not. So basically it's rust in the source of the infection and fire when it basically spreads. So that's why basically Anglo-American rust really, you know, Anglomania to a substantial extent creates the French Revolution because they're like, oh, why don't we have a constitutional democracy just like England? Um, and um, um, then, you know, a, a century and a half later in Russia, they're like, oh, that worked out really well for France, uh, you know. Um, um, and um, but so when you when you look at sort of rust versus fire, um, you know, in both cases, you're seeing this increasing disorder. And both of these are processes that are not reversible processes. Um, and so when you think about it, do you have any kind of a math background? Have you done much? Uh, uh, totally fine. So um, for those with a math background, um, there's something called an integral, which you're probably aware of, which is just the area under a curve. Um, and, um, you know, everybody probably had to look at that at some point. And when you measure basically the impact of leftism, what you're measuring is basically the height of the curve is like how much shit are they disrupting and the, you know, what they get done, their actual productive work is the area under the curve. So a lot of people, when they think about opposing um, leftism, reverse that and say, let's do something that will create a bunch of area under the curve. Let's basically cause some trouble for them. That will increase our capacity to cause more trouble. Just like a little bit of fire causes more fire, a little bit of rust on your car causes more rust. Somehow rust has this process where it spreads like cancer, even though it's not alive. And so they sort of operate on that basis that basically doing small things is good because small things add up. That is a very, very bad way to think for their opponents because order is a very different thing from disorder. And when you want to create order, what you're looking at is basically always a situation in which this is done all at once. So actually, when you're thinking about, um, you know, sort of the benchmark for success in a political sense, you're not thinking about the area under the curve. You're thinking about the peak value of the curve. If you dissipate, you're basically your your sort of your energy system is more like a capacitor and less like a battery. What you're doing it is charging it for a spike. And in your spike, everything has to work just right. And you basically only get one chance. Your shit is already burned out. 